our message this morning, we return once again to the, the book of 2 Corinthians. And the question that I want us to consider this morning is this, are we ready and willing to accept the mission? That's a question I want us to kind of ponder in our, in our minds. Are we ready and willing to accept the mission? You know, as I think about that idea of a mission, I want to ask, first of all, for all of you that at some point in your lifetime you served with one of our armed forces, if you would just raise your hand, let us see how many of you here at one point or another. Keep your hands up and look around, folks. Isn't that amazing? Put your hands down. Thank you, first of all, for your service to our country. But you know, as you think about it, congregations all around our, our state and country, it's amazing that that much of a sampling of folks have served at some point in the armed forces. And you know, as I think about this idea of accepting a mission, those guys... You all know what it means to accept a mission. When you signed up, when you served our country, you knew uh, what it meant to be under the commander, uh, someone that would tell you exactly when and what to do. You understand that idea. But, you know, also the rest of us that have not served necessarily in an armed forces role, the rest of us also can understand this idea of being ready for a mission. Because as believers, that's really the invitation that we have each and every day. That God offers us that invitation to follow Him. As Christ followers, we're saying, I'm ready to be under the charge of another. I give my life to Him and I want to live my life under His commands. You know, as I think about that invitation, though, to be under God's mission, according to His plan, some folks, maybe non-believers or maybe even believers, would look at you and say, you know what, this mission that you're striving for, this is mission impossible. Now, maybe you conjure up a picture here. Back in 1966, there was a series under that title, Mission Impossible. Now, most of us here... Uh, know the original, the, but some of us just know the modern remakes of it. I wasn't around for the original series, but I've seen the modern remakes. The rest of us can catch up. We know the picture here. Mission Impossible. Well, the scene would start in each of the TV series episodes with this statement. This is your mission should you choose to accept it, right? You remember that from the series. Well, that really could be the starting point for our message today. This is your mission should you decide to accept it. As we consider once again from the book of 2 Corinthians, we're going to see a mission that, that God calls us to, that, that Paul urges us to accept, but the question we have to ask is, are we willing to accept it? Well, we're going to look at chapter 11 today, and my goal was to move through a, a section of chapter 11, and we were going to be on to chapter 12 by this evening. Well, uh, just forget that. We'll be in chapter 11 again tonight. There's a lot to be discovered here. We're going to look at just the, the first four verses, and all of these go under the heading of the mission leader. That's our, our first point, and I won't say it's the only point, uh, but that's the big heading here. The mission leader. When we talk about accepting the mission, it's knowing and understanding our mission leader. Look there in chapter 11 in your Bibles, verse 1 down to verse 4. It says, Oh, that you would bear with me, and a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Essentially what Paul is saying as he begins this section here on the, the mission leader is don't put up with any other Jesus, any other spirit, any other gospel than what we proclaim to you. And so he's going to challenge them to know the mission leader. Well, as we consider this idea of knowing the mission leader, what does that mean? Is that just knowing who God is? Well, I put some points up here that I think really define what it means to know the mission leader. It's first of all, knowing godliness. It's allowing the gospel to change our lives. So we, we live in holiness, we live in godliness. We're going to see that as we walk through these four verses. But it's also knowing the gospel, knowing the, the good news of Jesus Christ that changes our lives. And as a result, the third thing there will be, we'll know God fully. So that's the idea of knowing the mission leader. While we were uh, there in, in Costa Rica a couple of years ago or more now, we would 
uh, have to depend on drivers. We'd get taxi drivers, tour drivers to get us where we needed to go, and often I would try to strike up conversations with the, the taxi drivers to grow my own language skill and just to enjoy getting to know some folks. Well, we were on one trip, and that tour driver fortunately spoke English. <laughs> Life was easy. Well, he and I were talking back and forth, fortunately, in English, and he said, well, where are you from? And I said, well, uh, South Carolina. He said, oh, yeah, I, I, that's great, South Carolina, I like that place. Okay. He said, well, what, what city are you from? I said, Greenville. He said, oh, wow. I love that downtown with the bridge and everything. That is a beautiful scene in downtown Greenville. Now, you can imagine my surprise when I'm talking to a, a tour driver in Costa Rica, and he says, boy, I love downtown Greenville. Now, you can imagine our connection when we got in. He was a driver, and I was just the passenger. But as we talked more and more, our conversation went deeper and deeper and deeper till we identified at a very uh, close level even where I grew up. You know, as we get to know the Lord, we get that invitation to go deeper and deeper in knowing who God is. And it's knowing godliness. It's knowing the gospel. And as a result, we'll know God fully. And so he invites us to accept the mission. And when we accept the mission, it's more than just saying, I'm a Christian. It's saying, I'm a Christian. And here's what God's doing in my life right now. Here's what God is, is teaching me right now. He takes us deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, as Paul began challenging the believers at Corinth and us as well over the course of, of ten chapters, he's really spent a great deal of effort to point everything to Christ. All of the attention pointing to Jesus Christ. You know, that's really the, the image that he casts as he goes through these ten chapters of making sure that everything was all about Jesus, like a, a flashing arrow. You know, he says in chapter 1, even at the outset of the, the book, he says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. In other words, he says everything that's going to follow, it's all about Jesus. If it was all about Paul, he would have been so very discouraged. He wanted to point everything to Jesus Christ. And so as we know God, as we know the mission leader, Paul said, I want you to know Jesus. He's going to talk about in this text here that those that, that came in after him that were trying to teach about some other Jesus, some other gospel, some other spirit, and he says, no, if you know Jesus as I have described him, you know him as the way, the, the truth, and the life. You know him as, the, as God incarnate, the word became flesh. You know him as no counterfeit. And he urged them to know the real Jesus. As we think about this invitation to, to know the mission leader, Paul wanted to point everything to Jesus Christ. Well, what does that then do for us? How does that change us? Well, it's that first thing that we know the mission leader as we accept his call to know godliness. Really, I think that's the first thing. As we know the mission leader, we accept his call to know godliness. Look there in verse 2. He explains this very clearly. He says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You know, as we... Look at that verse and how he presents Christ to us. Really, we ought to circle a few of those words, some key words that I think stand out. This idea of godly jealousy. That ought to stand out to us, that we serve a jealous God. Well, why in the world would God be jealous? Well, who else is worthy of our praise? Who else is worthy of our admiration, our lives? It's, and so God is jealous. He desires our praise. He created us. And so His desire is that we would worship Him, lift up His name. He says, godly jealousy. He adds another word, I think is a key word in that verse, betrothed. That's a picture of a strong bond. That if I know the mission leader, he pictures it as betrothed to the mission leader. But then he says, one step further, he says this idea of chaste, of pure. In other words, if I know the mission leader, then it affects how I live my life. We live in God-likeness. What do I mean by that? Well, I think there's a, a contrast that we need to make. Maybe we don't think about this often enough. That what defines me as a believer? Well, some would say it's, the, first of all, the first category, confessional Christianity. <coughs> now, some of you would, you would say, well, of course it's confessional Christianity. I've got scripture that can back that up. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. 
And so confessional Christianity, that's the, the beginning point, that if I will confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, I'll stand on that scripture, Romans 10, 9, right? Well, you know, I think the Bible, though, points to another step, though. Because if we go just a little bit further in Romans, going over to Romans chapter 12, this is what it says there. It says that we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So you can see it there on the diagram. We've got confessional Christianity where we stop and say, well, it's simply me saying I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's the stopping point. I am a believer. That's all God's Word calls me to. But if we keep on going in Paul's letter to the Romans, it's there, striving for holiness, that I have to present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. You know, as I think about that, maybe we ask the question of how he saves me, what I must do to be saved, but we never ask the question, why did he save me? You see, there is a why in salvation, and the why is that we would strive for holiness. Now, one thing I enjoy having is lots of resources, lots of books around me. People say, wow, you got a lot of books, you must be smart. No, I've got a lot of books because I'm not smart. I need a lot of resources. I need folks to lean on. Well, at times I'll, I'll pile up books and, well, I thought, well, let me just look at my recliner, for example, around my chair at home. I've got a, a shelf here, a little shelf here. I've got an armrest here, an armrest here, an armrest on the couch, and books kind of collect all around me. I saw, decided when I was looking at this message, how many books are just around my recliner? I counted 62 books. <laughs> you say, that's a problem, Michael. I think you're hoarding here. That's not good. Well, why do I collect all those books? Well, because they have pretty spines. I love the colors, and they just look so nice on the shelf. They, oh, it just makes the decor look right. You know what? If that's all those books accomplish in our house, then I've defeated the whole purpose of having them. I have to open them up and say, all right, what does this author teach me? What does... What is his perspective on the subject I'm learning about here? And you know, as I open it up and begin to dive through those pages, then it begins to change who I am. Uh, as I learn more about God, as I learn more about an area where maybe I haven't been challenged, you know, I have to open them up and say, now, change me. Well, that's the difference between confessional Christianity and striving for holiness. It's saying, yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, I do confess with my mouth, but then I say, God, now I present my body as a living sacrifice. Change me. The why of salvation is to lead me into holiness. Listen to Paul's letter to the believers at Ephesus along this same idea of the why of salvation. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Why are we saved? Paul says that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. If we go a little further in the book of Ephesians, he says, Put off the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust." and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was creating, created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Folks, we ought to see that when we talk about, I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the call of Scripture is that we understand godliness. We understand what it means to know Him more each and every day, and so as we accept the mission, we say, God... I long to know who you are as the mission leader, and the way I show that, the way I demonstrate that is each and every day saying, God, I haven't obtained it yet, but I press on toward the mark. Shape me today so that I can know you more. Allow it to change me. Now, some of you would say, well, that's Paul's message. Michael, you only used uh, quotations from Paul. Maybe that's just Paul's idea of salvation. Well, in Matthew 7, 21, these are Jesus' words. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You say, well, Michael, you're emphasizing a work salvation. No, absolutely not. There is no way that I can earn my salvation, but there ought to be something that proves that salvation has taken place. And Paul looked at the Corinthians, he says, oh, that you would bear with me. Oh, that you would, would hear me out a little bit. You know, as Paul says that there in verse 1, I would say I, I, I'm willing to bear with Paul a little bit. 
Why? Because I've seen the evidence of his life. I want to understand and learn from Paul. And so he says there in verse 1, bear with me a little bit. And the reason he urged them to, to bear with him is because he realized there was a life calling that he needed to teach the Corinthians and to us today. That we need to be changed as we confess the Lord, but also as we strive toward holiness. So how do I know the mission leader? Talking about accepting the mission, how can I know that commander? Well, I need to know his expectations. See, you better believe when these guys that raised their hand talking about serving in the military, that when you talked about one of their commanders, one of their, their officers they had to report to, when you said, well, I know that officer, they weren't just saying, well, I know his name. They were saying, I know what he's like. I know that he doesn't put up with anything. I know he's strict. Boy, you don't mess with him. You see, it was not only knowing who he was, but his demands. And as we consider this invitation, it's knowing the expectation of God in godliness. But also, we know the mission leader as we accept his call to truly know the gospel. Look there in verse 3. He says there, But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, as Paul tried to point the attention of the Corinthians uh, toward this idea of truly knowing the mission leader, he took them all the way back to creation in the fall. He took them to this picture of what took place there in, in creation where man rebelled away from God and chose to sin, and because of that was banished from that perfect place of, of creation. So really it's this tension of being in the world, but not of the world. You know, I was listening to a, a comedian that was talking about this dialogue that probably took place, we don't know, at creation. And man was, was considering this, this idea that he couldn't find a helpmate that was suitable for him, and he came back to God, and he made this request, could you make me a, a suitable helper? Could you make me a companion? Imagine there was a, a pause for a moment. God looked at him and says, yes, I, I can do this, I, I, I can... Create a woman for you. I can give you exactly what you're requesting right now. But let's clear one thing up first. You do realize that right now, you can hunt, fish, and play golf any day or time of the week right now, don't you? And God created a woman. How about that? Well, I don't agree with that. That was another comedian that said that. You know, think about what took place, though. It was bigger than the creation of, of man and woman because what took place there in creation was the fall. And really it's the idea of the, the image of God in which we were created. That image was somehow taken away as we chose to sin and rebel away from God. God created us in His image and as we were created in His image, we could walk and talk with God. We could fellowship with our Creator. We could have that intimate walk with Him. But as we chose to sin, that was then broken. We were expelled from the garden. And now that image is somehow broken. And so as Paul here in, in chapter 11, verse 3, he's saying this idea of being corrupted by Satan. This is the idea, look back all the way at the beginning. You've seen this story from the very outset that Satan deceives and he's deceiving even today. And yet he's saying you can be restored into the image of Christ, that relationship, the image of God that was imparted on us. In fact, that's exactly what Paul taught in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's good news right there. He says he's in the restoration business. That although that image of God has been broken by our sin, he says here that he is in the image restoration business. He's willing to transform us into His likeness with ever-increasing glory. As I think about knowing the mission leader, it's knowing the gospel. It's knowing the good news of Jesus Christ, that He redeems, He restores. And so today, as we come in here to worship, we don't have to come in here with our heads hanging down saying, boy, I missed it again this week. Boy, I didn't measure up again, God. No, we come in saying, God, because of Jesus Christ, because of salvation made possible through Christ, I can come in and say, once again, the image of God, this place as we gather together, we can honor His name not only with our lips, but also with our lives. We can know the gospel. And so we know the mission leader as we strive toward godliness. 
And that's a a lifetime process. There are those that would say there will uh, come that time in your life where you will be completely sanctified. Well, that'd be awesome if that was true, but I just don't think Scripture teaches that. I think Scripture teaches us that each and every day we are wrestling with this old sin nature that keeps pulling us back, but we strive toward godliness. I know the mission leader, as I say, all right, I'm going to follow your commands, and I'm going to demonstrate that in my own obedience. I know the commander. I know his expectations, but also I know the gospel. And when I realize all of that, then I can know God fully. We know the mission leader as we accept his call to know God fully. Look there in verse 4. It says, Therefore, if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. It says, Therefore, if he who comes preaches another Jesus, In other words, he challenges them to not accept a counterfeit. I've shared this illustration before. The illustration of one of the greatest con men in American history, his name is Frank Abagnale Jr., and he was the the inspiration for the movie Catch Me If You Can. And over the course of his criminal career, Frank Abagnale Jr. was able to con people out of of somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half million dollars. And his Uh, His skills in forging checks and even becoming an airline pilot were just an amazing thing. He was certainly a con man. Well, as we think about that example there, as uh, the reality of con men today, Paul was saying there's a con going on here. Folks are coming in after my message of who Jesus Christ is, and they're presenting another Jesus. They're presenting another spirit, another message of God's word. And so I would say to you you today, realize that's a counterfeit. Trust in the one true Jesus Christ, the hope of salvation. Know God fully. In many ways, he's once again saying, put the spotlight on Jesus. A number of years ago, when I was at Anderson College, I was invited to help out with one of the the Christian concerts. And they asked me to, to operate one of the spotlights. Well, that's simple enough. You turn the light on, and at the end, you turn it off, right? But what I realized was when they handed me headphones, I said, apparently there's more to this. They began to train me on, all right, which one is stage left, stage right? So it's this right, that right? I don't don't know which one it is. They said, all right, now I'm going to give you this number, and that's this color, then this number, and this this color. And I was, oh, my head was spinning. And over the course of that hour show or so, they commanded me over and over again, all right, turn it on. All right, back off. Number one, number two. One after another. You know what I realized? Wherever that spotlight was, that's where all the attention turned. And they used that spotlight to uh, orchestrate the show, to turn the attention in different ways. And Paul has really done that throughout the letter. He's saying, let me put the spotlight back on Christ. Know God fully. You know, as we consider the message he shared here, he gives them this challenge here. He says, if he comes preaching another Jesus that we've not preached, put the spotlight back on the true Jesus. He's labored to put the focus on the one mission leader. As we consider what it means to be those under the mission, those that are accepting the mission, and what does it mean for my life? Well, first of all, it means that I need to know that God changes me, that God shapes me. I know godliness. There may be those of you here today that say, you know what, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever whatever it was, and we say, well, how do you know that? Well, I I came down, I prayed a sinner's prayer, and then I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Well, I would say that Scripture calls us to go beyond that. Wonderful. If you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13, will be saved. But we can't neglect the rest of Scripture that says we have to know godliness. Today, I think every one of us in here could confess some area of our lives where we would say, you know what, I'm missing the mark right there. I realize God is calling me to to step up, to be different, to be salt and light in a dark world. And so maybe today we say, I need to know godliness. Maybe I need to know the gospel. You know, the gospel is good news. 
It's exciting news. It's wonderful news. And so I don't come into worship saying, boy, I missed it again. And so maybe God doesn't want to see me in here today. No, He loves to see you here because you are here for a purpose, to learn from His Word, to, to worship Him in spirit and truth. The gospel was always good news, and it always received was received as good news, but it also was received with an expectation of life change. We know the gospel. And if I know those things, then folks, I know God fully. What does it mean to accept the mission? Well, first and foremost, it's understanding who is the mission leader and how does that change my life? Let me ask you folks, has it changed you? Has it changed radically who you are and, and how you react and how you live your life, even how you worship today? Boy, I long for us to be freed up just to worship Him in spirit and truth. You see, if I really understand the mission leader, then I let go of everything and say, God, here's my life. I long to serve you. Mercy drops round us or falling, but for the what? The showers we plead. Maybe that's the thing we need to say. We see your mercy drops falling all around us, but today, God, we want to see showers. And as we know the mission leader, it changes everything about how we accept the mission. Let's pray. Lord, we realize when we truly understand who you are, it radically changes who we are. And Lord, today we consider that call of your word that we find again and again that we would know godliness. Lord, change us by the good news. Change us by the gospel. Lord, help us to know God fully. Lord, today we pray. We seek your face. And we're saying, God, we are desiring to know you as we've never known you before. And maybe there would be one here today that would say, yep, I did confess Jesus Christ as my Savior many years ago, but that's really where it stopped. I haven't allowed the gospel to change who I am. I haven't allowed it to, to shape my life in such a way that I'm different today, that I'm different from I was, how I was last week, a year ago. Lord, maybe today we need to say just we're going to allow ourselves to be living sacrifices. And we're not going to be deceived by another gospel that simply comforts us and, and appeals to our itching ears, but we would say, God, help me to hear a gospel that says you've got to be changed by it. Lord, what an exciting thing to be able to say today, we get to accept the mission. What a radical thing when we look at the mission leader. Maybe just as we begin at that point of realizing that mission leader, we would bear with Paul as he invited us to, to know the true Jesus, the true gospel, the spirit as we receive it. Lord, I thank you that even in this time, we've had the opportunity to worship you, but now we have the opportunity to respond. Now as that invitation you offer us, help us not to harden our hearts to how you're speaking through your spirit. It's in your name we pray, amen. Let's stand now as we respond.